Uh, first of all, I want to say about Amber Spradlin's situation in Floyd County, Kentucky. As of today, um, Amber died in June. We're coming up on six months since she passed away, since she was murdered. And there still has not been an arrest. And it's starting, in my opinion, as I'm reading the comments and, and following people who are talking on this subject, it's starting to divide people. I mean, it basically it already has divided this community. Um, there are the people who support the police and support um, the 911 system there in Floyd County, and there are others who say had they responded that morning to the first 911 call that Amber may, may have been saved. I personally am on the fence about that because I don't know if the first 911 call was made during the attack, after the attack, or even before the attack. The only people that know that are the five others who were in the home that morning. And now we're starting to hear rumors and speculation and even some possible facts that there were that there was evidence removed that uh, there was an attempt to clean up this this uh, crime scene. Cameras might have been taken down. There's a lot of stuff being talked about, but the one thing that stands true is that no one has been arrested. No one has been charged. Now, what's going on behind the scenes, I don't know, but these people are living their lives every day day I personally myself saw one of these people who was at the house that day at their job about two weeks ago doing their job just everyday routine I know the others have and and it was pointed out last night I believe it was last night that one of these people kind of was throwing it in the face of the Justice for Amber page. Apparently they were seen at a, a sports event and they said to the person, be sure to run back and put it on that page. Let people know that I was here, you know. So it's just like these people are going on with their everyday lives. They're going on as though nothing ever happened. And the family of Amber and the community who support justice for her are over here asking the question what's what's the difference between these people someone took a knife and stabbed this woman to death what's the difference between that person and any other person out there who was at a crime scene where someone was murdered and that person may be arrested immediately without even any evidence or, you know, and then it's up to them to defend themselves. It's up to them to, you know, say, here's what really happened and present the evidence and get a lawyer to help them to show their side of the story. So far, we've only heard the side of the story of that this girl was murdered and that's pretty much where it stands right now. And it's very sad for the people in the community and her family having to deal with this. Um, I'm not saying that all five people who were there that night took part in this murder, but all five of them um, were there. And one of them killed this woman. Do the other four know who that person is? And have they said to the police, this is the person that you want. This is the person that committed this crime. I doubt very much because we know that at least three of these people, we know that two of them are father and son. And it's my, 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 to my knowledge, 
from what I've read and from what's been posted is that one of the other ones is like a son to them, is like a, another, is like a family member to them, has been a part of their family for, for a while. And the other person that we know of, that I know of, is, was Amber's friend. Now that leaves one more person that I've yet to hear um, mentioned. I'm sure so. I'm sure others out there know who it is, but I myself have not found that information yet. But I just wanted to come back and touch on that. That that case is still, as far as I know, is still under investigation. DNA was, you know, the the state police said that they were waiting for DNA to come back, and despite the fact that they said that they pushed this to the front of the you know, priority list, they still haven't made an arrest. And as Christmas approaches, Thanksgiving must have been a hard time for Amber's family. And as Christmas approaches, one family is is grieving and trying to figure out why they are still waiting for answers and the other families going on with their normal celebrations and the status quo. And I just wanted to touch on that. That's this. I know you all are hearing my, as I speak, you're, you're picking up on the fact that I am on the side of the justice for Amber group. And I want justice for her. I want, I want justice for anyone who is brutally murdered in the way that she was. But in this area, when it, which I'm from this area, I'm close to Floyd County, so I know some of these people by name. And you just you just kind of know. It's just kind of a known fact who's a player and who's, who's important and who's not. And everyone, I think, can agree on this. If this had happened at a home one holler over or one road over or a family that did not have the kind of standing or the kind of name or the kind of occupations that this family had, this person probably already would have been arrested and very well may have already been sitting in jail, may already have, you know, started the court proceedings. I don't know. But I wanted to come back and talk about that. And the next case that I wanted to come back and talk about is the Layla Santanello case that I just covered very recently. Now, I learned some new details on the situation with her as I've started following a group um, on Facebook about her. Now, this is from the U.S. Sun And this was posted December the 2nd. Um, Odd behavior inside Layla Santanello's strange final 12 hours before she vanished. As new surveillance footage changes the timeline. Now in the story, I talked about how she had been staying at the AmeriCourt Hotel in Kingsport. And that her last known sighting was at uh, the Marble Creamery uh, ice cream shop and that she had told someone there that she was going to Five Below to purchase a pair of shoes as she was barefoot. And she never made it to Five Below. So now new information has come out that has changed that just a little bit. So it is believed the young mom was last sighted leaving an ice cream shop on North Eastman Road. However, investigators with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation no longer say that that was the last sighting. Layla's stepmom told the U.S. Sun last week that she has been conducting her own probe into Layla's disappearance with the help of a private investigator. Last week, her P.I. uncovered new footage from outside a storage facility showing a shoeless Layla heading south 
toward the Kingsport Greenbelt, some distance from the ice cream store. Now, I don't know how far from the ice cream store this is. I am somewhat familiar with Kingsport, but like I, I'm almost certain I know where this ice cream store is, but the green belt and some of that, I'm sure that there's people who are, are more familiar with Kingsport that could say how far this might have been. Um, where she went from there remains a mystery. The TBI and the PI are now combing back through surveillance footage from the area in June in search of new leads. Layla was barefoot, of course, as we said, and um, her mother and her stepmother have spent the last four and a half months meticulously tracing Layla's last movements. The troubling saga began on June the 24th, three days before Layla was last seen, when Jennifer, her mother, Jennifer, received a message from Layla's boyfriend on Layla's Facebook account asking if Layla was in jail or what was going on because he hadn't heard from her. Um, he didn't know where she was. Later that same night, Layla messaged her mom from that same account, telling her mom, I'm fine, I'm with a friend, I don't have a phone to call or text, I'm using someone else's phone. Now, was that Layla? If she didn't have her phone and her boyfriend had messaged the mother earlier that day on Layla's Facebook account, where was Layla's phone? Did he have it? So the mom says, okay, I love you. And Layla responded, I love you so much. Layla and her boyfriend, according to Layla's mother, had a falling out in the days prior to her leaving and staying with friends. She stayed with friends for a few nights and then she went and checked into the AmeriCorps Hotel or Motel along American Way on June the 25th. By the time she made it to the hotel, she was disheveled and appeared to be paranoid as it was said that she was trying to hide. Witnesses said it appeared that she was trying to hide, that she was trying to she just appeared to be paranoid, like she was looking around, and the stepmother says that she has learned even more new details about the nature of Layla and her boyfriend's argument. Friends of Layla's informed her that she had secretly started seeing another man. They believe that Layla's boyfriend found out about this, and they got into a fight, and Layla left on foot without her shoes or any of her personal belongings. She ran to one of her friend's houses. Layla spent two nights sleeping at her friend's home um, and one of, and spent one, at least one night, they believe. But this is just the speculation that they've been able to, you know, come up with in the timeline. They believe that she spent one night with this new love interest. And after there, from there, she went to the AmeriCorps motel. And she had a friend who was staying at that motel, so she went there as well. On June the 26th, other guests at the motel reported seeing her going door to door. Now, I asked this question in the other video that I did. What was she doing going door, door to door? Was she asking for money? Was she asking to use a phone? Was she asking for a ride somewhere? Um, she appeared to be in a state of distress, but several people offered her help and she declined. One asked if she wanted to use their phone and she declined and another asked if she needed a ride home and she declined. So I'm not really sure what it was she was going door to door 
At some stage in the late morning on the 26th, there was another altercation between Layla and another unknown person. According to the stepmother, someone told her that Layla said, I have to take care of something. And then she walked off into the nearby woods. There's a warehouse near the woods, and there were approximately five employees working that day, and they could see Layla. Um, the last known sighting of Layla came the following day outside of the storage facility, and then her trail goes cold. It was Layla's father and stepmother who would report her missing in the early hours of June the 27th. Her stepmother said Layla was struggling with a fentanyl addiction at the time of her disappearance and had recently lost custody of her daughter. So her stepmother is speaking to her and she says, wherever you are, come home and we will start over. You can be given a new day, a new chance, at a new beginning. With the right therapy and support, we you will be able to overcome anything that you're facing right now. She had gotten into an altercation with someone at the hotel, and the it was the 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 commotion must have been reported to the hotel um, office, or they could hear it happening. And they told Layla that if she didn't calm down, that they were going to evict her from the hotel. Now, it was around this time that she took off out into the woods. And she was seen by the people who worked at this warehouse. Um, they said that she stuck out from a mile away, meaning it was odd that she was out there alone in the woods and... Um, they just noticed her. They thought it was very odd. So the family was provided with a glimmer of hope that would later turn out to be false. So there was another part of this story that is talked about here. And um, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation has not yet responded to a request from the U.S. Sun seeking additional information in the case. The family was provided with a glimmer of hope that would turn out to be false. Hope that Layla was alive roughly two weeks after she was last seen. Now, a series of strange cash app requests came from Layla's account. These were sent to the mother and the stepmother asking for money. In the subject line of one request seeking $100, the letters TWLMG appeared on the screen. Several requests were made with the same subject line over a period of several minutes, and so Jennifer sent her daughter's account $1 with a message asking if she was okay. As a back and forth of transactions ensued, Jennifer said she believed the acronym in the subject line meant, they won't let me go. And she believed that her daughter was being held hostage. We fear our kids disappearing or losing them, but you never believe that's going to happen to you, said her mother. She contacted the police and began asking the requester of the funds more specific questions to verify if it was Layla. At some point, she said, I started asking, what's your brother's name? What's your baby brother's birthday? And other specific questions that she knew Layla would know. But this person just kept ignoring the questions. Jennifer said she knew that something was wrong here, but then periodically throughout the next several weeks, the request would come, and then the request got more and more threatening. One such threatening request was made for $95, 
with the caption, for 15 minutes or you'll find her in pieces. They were very detailed about the things that they were going to do if we didn't send them the money, she said. But the sad thing is, over all those conversations, because you had to send one dollar to send a sentence, we probably did send the amount of money that they were asking for just to keep them talking, just to keep, you know, corresponding with them. Authorities were eventually able to access the account and determine who was sending the messages. According to Jennifer, the Cash App messages had been part of a hoax conducted by someone who had once been one of Layla's so-called friends. They were attempting to profit from the tragedy and were impersonating her. I can't say who it was, but it added trauma on top of an already terrible situation, Jennifer said. As of right now, there's no reason to believe the person who did it had anything to do with her disappearance. It just seemed like somebody who thought they could come up with a way to get some money. Jennifer said the culprit's home was searched and there was no sign that Layla had been there. The individual was... The individual was not one of the friends that Layla had stayed with. She called it a crime of opportunity and said the person responsible had allowed Layla to log into her account weeks earlier, but she had never logged back out. Insisting she's now living every parent's worst nightmare, Jennifer has admitted that her optimism of finding Layla alive is wanting with each passing day. You see it happen on the news and you have sympathy, but you just can't believe that would ever happen to you. There's no closure. There's no answers. You have no idea if she's alive or not. It's the worst feeling in the world. As she patiently waits by the phone for updates, Jennifer says she routinely tries to prevent her mind from going to the darker places. She knows the cash app incident is just one indication that her daughter was not keeping the best company. We had noticed a change in Layla's behavior and she was becoming more withdrawn and isolated. On the day of her disappearance, Jennifer says that Layla may have been abducted by sex traffickers or suffered some kind of psychotic breakdown. If she believes she was in any danger, Jennifer says, she still can't understand why Layla didn't call home for help. She believes that her daughter was not of sound mind. Well, like I said before, the fentanyl addiction, the drug addiction, um, and they said that she was behaving as though she was very paranoid. It may be that she wasn't in her state of mind. I spoke about Holland Snap in the other video. Now, Jennifer, Layla's mother, believes that the two may be, you know, the two disappearances could be related. However, her stepmother, Brittany, says she doesn't believe that. Um, they went missing about a mile, about three miles apart and about a month apart. They were known, it was it was said that they were known to have kind of hung around with some of the same people and maybe they even knew each other. It's very possible that they may have, like I said in the other video, their cases may not be directly related as, as though maybe Layla reached out to Holland or something like that, but it could be that Holland got mixed up with some of the same people situations and some of the same people if you didn't listen to that other video keep in mind that Holland who was 19 was said to function mentally and emotionally at around the age of a 10 year old so her decision making skills were not that of an adult That's basically all there was on that. That was just an update that I wanted to come back and talk a little bit about. Another thing that I wanted to mention here real quick was the story I did recently on the two little boys, the lost boys. 
one was named Chris Grass or Jeremy Grass, who was known by Chris. He was a little four-year-old boy who um, went missing in South Carolina. Some questions that I had about him, and I I went through Reddit, I went through um, Web Sleuth and some other, trying to find anything on him. The neighbor claims to have seen the little boy at about 8.45 a.m. outside by the mailbox barefoot. My question is, were the neighbors in the area questioned? Were homes searched? Did the police go door to door, knocking on doors? We all remember the story of the little girl who went missing and the focus by the by the media and everybody was on her own grandfather. And they started going through his background and ripping him to pieces. And it turned out the whole time that she'd been taken by a man who lived in a mobile home, not just basically across the road and had held her there in that mobile home for several days. And he was never questioned. They didn't go door to door. I just wondered if these neighbors were questioned. How did the dog get back inside if the little boy was gone? Did the little boy come back in, bring the little dog back inside the house and then leave again? Those were just some questions, and I just wondered if any, you know, if anybody did um, go door to door. Because his story just kind of came to an end, you know. It was like um, it, it, he was last seen in the yard by a neighbor and. There wasn't very much follow-up, and I was very curious in the years that followed his disappearance. You know, did did they deem this a cold case? Because I hated that there was so much detail about the other little boy, um, Andy Puglisi. There was so much about him and the, the possible suspects. You know, the details were that he resided in a mobile home on Russell Hill in the Bath area of North Augusta, South Carolina. He lived with his mother and stepfather and baby sister. Um, there was one serial killer who was known to have been in that area. He had... Um, thought to have killed a nine-year-old girl in 1994. Her remains were found in 2005. He denies knowledge of both cases. He would have been a teenager at the time that Grice disappeared, and he was never charged in the connection. Someone come along and pick him up? Did he think that he had school that morning? Did he believe that he missed the bus and attempted to, you know, walk? Would he have known how to walk to his school? How far was it? Did another neighbor come along and see him? And and here's my thoughts on this. The neighbor said he believed, or they believed, that the child was waiting for the school bus, yet he was barefoot. Did the neighbor go out and say to them, hey, why are you barefoot out here in the cold grass? You know, where's your mom? I guess they didn't. At any time that Lieutenant Becky Edmonds looks back over the black and white photo of four-year-old Jeremy Grice, who disappeared 25 years ago. Now, keep in mind, this is from 2010, so he actually disappeared in 1985. The boy has never been found, but Edmonds admits she occasionally sees boys who she believes could resemble him and wonders if this could be him. She thinks about him as a little boy playing with his peers on the playground, and she thinks those little boys have now grown up into men and now have children of their own. Whatever happened to Jeremy? 
years later, this, this person is saying that there was a lead in the case that investigators later said was unfounded. I presume his bike wasn't missing. Um, the neighbor said it was a mailbox. So was it right directly in front of the home or was it down the road? If you think of a mobile home park, very often all the mailboxes are set in one little location next to the roadway because most mail carriers are not going to drive to each mobile home and drop off the mail. It appears the only last verifiable sighting of Jeremy by anyone other than his mother and father, stepfather would have been this neighbor who claims to have seen the child standing by the mailbox, believing the child was waiting for the school bus, but barefoot. So there's so many unanswered questions in that case. The last update on K Katie White Massey was on November the 19th. Her car had been located in Oklahoma City. No foul play is suspected. And um, there's been nothing else posted by the person that posted this to begin with since November the 24th. So I have typed her name in to look to see if she's listed as a missing person to see what the last update was on her five days ago. Katie White, Katie Massey White, missing since November the 16th, was last seen in Moorhead, Kentucky. Her car was later located in Oklahoma City. Her phone also pinged in Oklahoma City. Her car was found at a Marriott garage on Gaylord Boulevard in Oklahoma. And that's basically the last update on her. Um, if she's out there, if she's alive and well out there, I hope that she's reached out to someone in her family or friends to let them know that she's okay. Something was definitely going on with her. I mean, maybe it's very possible that she just decided I'm just going to take a trip. But what was the what was all the secrecy about? You know, that that I think was the big um, reason people were sharing her story and asking questions. And the last post that she herself posted that I can see was November the 15th. So this would have probably have been the day that she was in more ahead. Um, give yourself time to rest. And it's just a little meme of the cat in the bed asleep. And so I just wanted to touch base on that story too. And that's all there was on her, but I am going to continue to look into her case and do a follow-up on her. I just wanted to come back and do a couple of these little quick, you know, s short stories and, and some updates for some people. And I know there's others. There's other stories that I've done that I have not um, followed up on, and I'm going to go back through some of my more recent videos and do some follow-ups. If there's been any more information, any new updated information, and thanks for watching.